Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone to our Bible study tonight. And I pray that the study of the Word will enrich our lives, will turn us in the right direction, and it will learn enough to make us serve the Lord acceptably in Jesus' name. I pray that the study will not be as usual, that I'm always there, we always come, and then we learn nothing. Everyone will learn today in Jesus' name. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you tonight. We bless your name for the good thing you have in your word to lead, to guide, to teach, to instruct. And we pray that your spirit will take everything we learn and lead us to repentance, to salvation, to holiness of life, and to a life that is pleasing unto you every time in Jesus' name. Help us to so learn that we'll be righteous and rapturable in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that your word will bring conviction to everyone. Conversion to those who need conversion, consecration, commitment to your word, and walking in the way of the Lord. We're asking, Lord, that you support and cleanse, that our lives will become pleasing unto you. That we'll not learn the word as just superficial people, but as people who come to you to be transformed and to be led in the way of the Lord in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And the church said, Amen. Today we're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And we're reading from verse 19, then from verse 26 to verse 40. At the beginning, we're going to choose some verses of scripture to lead us into the study. Open your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 19. Yet in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also that by my words I might teach others also. That underlines the purpose of coming to the study. That underlines the purpose of hearing the word of God. That underlines the purpose of everyone coming to the church, learning, hearing, being instructed, and going in the way of the Lord. That the preacher that the ministers, that all the people that minister to us will speak, even if it is only five words, with their understanding that by their voice, by their declaration, by their teaching, they will teach others also. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, how we see then, brethren, when ye come together, Every one of you has a psalm, has a doctrine, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. Again, that tells us as we come to the study and as we come to hear and learn the word of God, that we're learning so that we will be edified. That word edify actually means being charged. Your telephone is down and you charge that telephone. You connect that phone with power. And the power that comes into the phone will charge the battery of the phone. Many times our lives are weak. Our lives are run down. Because we run up and down, we reach here, we touch here, we go here, we go there. 
the strength goes down. And when we come to the study or we come to the church, we're to be charged, we're to be edified, we're to be uplifted, we're to be encouraged, and we're to be empowered to move on in the things of the Lord, in the way of the Lord. It says, let all things be done unto edifying. You have a psalm, give it out, let it edify. You have a doctrine, give it out, let it edify. You have a tongue, give it out, let it edify. You have a revelation, give it out, let it edify. You have interpretation of the word, interpretation of the tongue, application of the word. Let all things, let all ministers do everything they do to edify the people they are ministering to. That tells us then when we're here today, the men, the women, the children, the youths, everyone participating in the Bible study were to sit down where to accept the word, embrace the word, learn from the word so that before you go back home, you have got something that empowers you, that energizes you, that induces you, and makes you to have edification and charging and bringing up your life. Look at verse 31. In verse 31, it tells us, for ye may all prophesy. The word prophesy is to declare, is to proclaim, is to know the mind of God, the word of God, the will of God, and declare that word and that will of God. It says, for ye may all prophesy one by one. Look at this, that all may learn, that all may learn. We study so as to learn. We hear so as to learn and we receive teaching so as to learn. We get instruction and it is so that we can learn. And look at that word there, all, everyone, all may learn and all may be comforted. All may learn and all may be encouraged. Look at verse 40. It says in verse 40, let all things be done let all things be done. It's talking about church work. It's talking about ministry. It's talking about teaching. It's talking about studying. It's talking about edifying other people. It's talking about giving out a psalm, giving out a doctrine, giving out instruction, giving out revelation, giving out the tongue, and giving out the interpretation. All those things, let everything be done decently and in order there should be no confusion there should be no modeling up everything should be very clear line upon line and precepts upon precepts that everyone may learn that's why today we're considering the message the study the preeminence of teaching in an heaven about church a church that makes up their mind that the reason they come to church is because of their goal to get to heaven a heaven bound church and you know if we're going to get to heaven there must be salvation and a saved church there must be sanctification a sanctified church there must be the power of the spirit of god in our lives in every one of the everyone in the church a spiritual church and if we're going to go to heaven we're not going all alone we want to get other people to go along with us we are a soul winning church and if we're going to be like that saved and sanctified and spirit filled and spiritual and soul winning we have to be praying every time because what we hear we pray about and it is the prayer that makes that to come into our hearts and gives us the power to live in the world. We have to be a supplicating church. We're supplicating, we're praying unto the Lord with all prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. That's a heaven bound church, and it's a church that is expecting the coming of the Lord. It's a second coming church. And if we're going to be a church like that, heaven bound, always looking up that Christ may come at any time 
the teaching of the word is very important not only that somebody is standing here like a teacher a pastor and is teaching the word the people who are receiving the word must be taught must accept the word and the teaching of that word must drive everyone to learn everything we need to learn so that we'll be heaven-bound christians in a heaven-bound church there are three things we're looking at today number one the significance of teaching for evangelization and edification the significance of teaching if nobody teaches the word, if nobody speaks about Christ, if nobody proclaims what Christ has done on the cross of Calvary, there'll be no salvation, there'll be no evangelization, and there'll be no planting of the church, there'll be no growth of the church. But we teach the word and we emphasize the word and we instruct the people that we go to in the word of the Lord teaching them so that the world can be evangelized and the church can be edified the significance of teaching for evangelization and edification number two the silence of the teachable for the effectiveness of exhortation as we exhort as we explain as we teach as we instruct the church the congregation must be silent and there are times when this section is silent that other one is ministering when this one is teaching that other one is silent and when we have everything put in order like that somebody speaks the other one keeps silent another one is teaching or singing the rest of the people are quiet it is that that makes us teachable and we receive the word of exhortation with effectiveness number two the silence of the teachable for the effectiveness of exhortation number three the spirituality of teachers the spirituality of teachers if the uh, teacher is not spiritual the hearers will not be spiritual if the teacher is not saved the hearers will not be saved if the teacher is not uh, sanctified the, te the people who are hearing will not be sanctified if the people who are ministering and the people who are bringing a psalm a doctrine or they are bringing a tongue or they are bringing revelation or they are bringing interpretation if the people who are bringing that message to the church if they are not saved and sanctified and spirit filled the people who are hearing they also will be superficial they will be shallow they will be secular everything will be a thing of the mind of the head it will not get to the heart to transform the heart that's the reason why the teachers and the ministers and the people people who are instructors of the people of God must be spiritual the spirituality of teachers without exaltation self-exaltation and without envy let's come to number one number one the significance of teaching for evangelization and edification let's come to first Corinthians chapter 14 reading from verse 19 yet in the church i had rather speak five words with my understanding that, that by my voice i might teach others also than ten thousand words in an unknown tongue and then in verse 26 it says that there is him why how is it then brethren when you come together when you congregate together when you come to worship and when you come to fellowship together every one of you has a psalm has a doctrine has a tongue has a revelation has an interpretation as you have that let everything be done in a constructive way in a consistent way in an effective way so that 
all things will be done to edifying. It tells us in verse 27, it says, For ye may all, in verse 27, if any man speak, a teacher, an instructor, a pastor, a preacher, a minister in the church, if any man speak, in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at most by three, that by cause and, and that by cause, and let one interpret. If there's no interpretation, if we just bring out the word and it's like it's like an unknown language, it's like that's Greek, I can't understand. That's German, I can't understand. That's Latin, I cannot understand. Uh, then it doesn't minister, it doesn't edify the people we're speaking to. And then in verse 28, it tells us, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. If there be no interpreter, that will bring the meaning of the message to us that will bring the impact of the message unto us, then there's no use. Let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. And then in verse 29, it tells us, let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. Let the preachers let those who speak to men to edification, to exhortation, and to comfort, let them speak a few at a time. One, two, like somebody teaches out the scripture, like the other one that is uh, giving an um, answering question, two or three, like the another one is moderating and giving us the summary of everything. Let those preachers, let those pastors, let those proclaimers, let those prophets speak two or three and let the other judge. Let there be somebody there who is mature, who is also hearing what the prophets and the proclaimers and the pastors, what they are telling the church, let him hear very well so he can judge that everything is in line with the word of God. It tells us in Bastachi, it says in Bastachi, if, any, if anything be revealed to another that seated by, let the first hold his peace. That he is, after this one has finished his own ministration and his own teaching, let him now sit down. And the one that has another revelation, a greater revelation, in death revelation, let him stand up while the other one is keeping quiet and holding his peace. Then he says in verse 31, it says, For ye may all prophesy one by one that all may learn, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. I want you to underline that word, learn, that all may learn. Whenever you come either to the study, or you come to the fellowship, or you come for worship, you're coming with the mind today, I'm going to learn something. A man, a woman, a child, everyone was seed with the understanding and was seed of the preparation of the heart. We're going to learn. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, Learn of me. As we teach, we're talking about Jesus the Savior. Learn. As we teach, we're talking about Jesus the Sanctifier learn. As we teach, we talk about Jesus the baptizer, learn. As we teach, we talk about Jesus the coming king, learn. As we teach, we talk about Jesus the author and the, and the finisher of our faith. You must learn. Jesus said, learn. Paul the apostle said in Philippians chapter 4 verse 9, he said, what you have heard and what you have seen, he says, those things which 
which ye have learned, which ye have learned and received and heard and seen in me do. After we have learned, then we pray to have the grace that we will do what we have learned. And he said, then the God of peace shall be with you. And he's saying that all may learn. That word all means you, means me, and means everyone. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, reading from verse 12, Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 12, it's saying we shall gather the people together. Look at this, the men and the women and the children. We gather everyone together. That's when we come to the church. And like we are like now, we're seated, we're quiet, and we're ready to take in every word of God. You gather the people together, the men and the women and the children. Our children are not running about. They are not here and there while the study is going on because it is for everyone that all may learn. And thy stranger that is within thy gates, our invitees and the people, who are here it says that they may hear look at this and they may learn they may learn and fear the lord your god and observe to do all the words of this law that's the reason why we're here it says in isaiah chapter 48 reading from verse 17 isaiah Chapter 48, we're reading from verse 17. Thus says the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord thy God, which teacheth thee to profit. I am the Lord thy God, which teacheth thee to profit. When we come to the church, either we're looking to the Psalms, or we're looking to Revelation, or we're looking to the epistles so that we can have instruction. Every teaching we have of the doctrinal part of the Word of God, everything we have is to make us so listen that we will profit by the word. And then it says, which leadeth thee in by the way that thou shouldest go. In verse 18, it says, oh, that thou art hearken to my commandments, then at thy peace being as a river, and thy righteousness at the waves of the sea. Our study, our fellowship, our communication, our sharing the word, our teaching the word is to make us profit in the word, the profit of salvation and the profit of a holy life and the profit of a consistent walk in the Lord and then to have the peace of God and then to have righteousness and for the righteousness to be as deep as the sea that is this in verse 19 in verse 19 thy seed also had been as the sand and thy and the offspring of thy bowels like the gravel thereof for his name should not have been cut off nor destroyed from before me we come we hear we pray we learn and then we profit by the word jeremiah chapter 31 in jeremiah chapter 31 reading from verse 33 but this shall be the covenant that i will make for the house of israel after those days says the lord i will put my law in their inward parts I will put my words in their inward parts. When we come to learn, the Lord then puts the word not just in our brain, and it's not just on our tongue, it's not floating superficially in our personality. It is written in our inward parts. And that's the essence of actually receiving the word into a sanctified heart into a purified heart, into a purged heart, into a heart that is receptive of the word of God. And the Lord, the word of God is reaching in our inward parts and our right age 
in their heart and will be their God and they shall be my people. Look at verse 34. In verse 34 it says, and they shall teach no more. Everyone, every man is neighbor and every man is brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them. You see that? From the least of them, the children, the boys and girls, the youths, those who are just growing up, and the parents, everyone that from the least and to the greatest of them, from the new converts to the members and to the ministers, it says, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. And then it gives us a life that is free. A life that is forgiven, a life that is full of the grace of God, and we're able to walk in the way of the Lord consistently. Psalm 51, reading from verse 7. In Psalm 51, here is the psalmist praying, Purge me with Esau, and I shall be clean, wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. It says, Wash me, cleanse me. I'll be clean, saved. I want to be saved. I want to be restored. I want all my sins to be forgiven against you and you alone. Have I sinned and committed this great trespass against you? And then he asked for forgiveness, but then he said, I don't want to wait at salvation. I want to be as white as snow, that's salvation. But then he says, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. I want to be sanctified. Look at verse 8. It says in verse 8, make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Actually, when he backslid, he has such sorrow. And then it's like his bones were broken. There's no joy anymore. He was still in position of a king, of a leader, but he had lost the joy of relationship, reconciliation, fellowship with the Lord. Now he wanted restoration from the backsliding so that the broken bones and the sorrowful hearts will now rejoice. The joy of salvation will now come back. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, he tells us, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation thy salvation the salvation that comes from heaven the salvation God himself gives after he sees that we have been sorrowful for our sinfulness and we have repented and we have turned unto the Lord with all our heart and we want the grace of God, the mercy and the love of God to find us and fish us out and get us out of that defilement and then we believe in the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ that Christ himself has offered and because we believe that then salvation comes and redemption comes, righteousness comes and we have the joy of salvation salvation when we are saved is not a mental belief it is such a deep-seated experience that there will be joy the sins are taken away there is assurance there's a cleansing and there's a definite experience of salvation with the Lord because the load is lifted because the burden is lifted because the guilt is lifted because condemnation is taken away now we have assurance of salvation and the joy joy of salvation restore unto me the joy of thy salvation uphold me with thy free spirit only then look at verse 13 then after that restoration then after that assurance of salvation then will i teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee look at matthew chapter chapter 28 we're looking at verse 19 it says go ye therefore and teach all nations 
if you are saved already go ye therefore and teach all nations your names are rich in the book of life in heaven go ye therefore and teach all nations i have prayed for you sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth go ye therefore after that experience you cannot go and teach other people salvation if you don't have salvation you cannot go and tell other people how to live a righteous life consistently righteous life if you're not righteous yourself but after we're saved after we're sanctified and then the power of the holy ghost now abides in us because he says study him in jerusalem until ye be endured with power from on high and then it says for the power will come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in jerusalem and in judea and in samaria then to the uttermost part of the earth we must have experience in christ reconciliation with christ righteousness through christ and the spirit of god must live within us actively living within us and be propelling us to go and do what the lord has called us to do only then can we effectively go and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and it says and of the holy ghost it says teaching them after we have brought them to know the lord and they have been converted and they are baptized in water in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost we don't uh, drop them and tell them to go back to where they are coming from because if they do that they go back to the devil the devil is the god of this world we say now you have come to the lord you need to learn more and know more about the lord that's why we bring them to the bible study that's why we'll bring them to the worship service that's why we bring them to the house fellowship so that now we're teaching them to observe all things whatsoever i have commanded you and lo i am with you always even to the end of the world and the people of god said amen, amen. look at john chapter 14 we're reading from verse 16 john chapter 14 reading from verse 16 and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you. How long? Tell me out aloud. That he may abide with you forever. Then in verse 17, here is what he says in verse 17. Even the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth, he will not abide where there's error, where there's falsehood. Where there's false doctrine, he will not abide. Where there is ignorance, he wants. When you are saved and you are sanctified and you are living and walking in the truth, and you are abiding in the truth, and you come out of darkness, out of error, out of falsehood, and then you are sanctified by the truth. Now he says, "In the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive." There are some people, they have not been saved. They are totally of the world, the language of the world, the character of the world, the lifestyle of the world. And then they come to what they call a spiritual Pentecostal assembly and they are praying, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, come on me, come on me. Holy Ghost cannot come on somebody who is still of the world, who is not saved, who is not born again whose life is not clean jesus said even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it saith him not neither knoweth him but she know him we're born again by the spirit of god and when we're born again we know him when we're sanctified we know him more for ye know him for he dwelleth with you saved and sanctified and shall be in you baptized in the holy ghost and then in verse 26 it tells us but the comforter which is the holy ghost whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. 
it shall teach you all things it will not uh, teach us without the teachers what that means is that if they're an apostle the Holy Ghost will be in that apostle and teach us all things is there a prophet the Holy Ghost will be in that prophet and teach us all things is there an evangelist the Holy Ghost will be in that evangelist and teach us all things is there a pastor the Holy Ghost will be in that pastor and teach us all things is there a teacher the Holy Ghost will be in that teacher and teach us all things that's how he teaches us he uses human instrument and he infills he endures he empowers he, he inspires that human instrument and through that he teaches us all things and then he says and bring all things to your remembrance the holy ghost if he dwells in us if he has a part in our lives he brings to our remembrance all things whatsoever i have said unto you it tells us in acts chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 37 acts chapter 2 we're reading from verse 37 now when they had this they were preached in their heart and they said unto peter and to the rest of the apostles men and brethren what shall we do they heard about what they had done about how they had crucified the Lord, about how they had used all those uh, people that bore false witness against the Lord to crucify the Lord. And Peter said, you are the one that have done that. And because of that conviction, all the all the things they thought their religion their tradition they were depending on everything was torn into pieces it they pulled down all the strongholds against the word of the lord conviction came to them and then they asked men and brethren what shall we do in verse 38 then peter said unto them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ for the remission removal forgiveness cleansing of your sin and ye shall receive the gift of the holy ghost the holy ghost will come and bear witness with your heart if you truly repent that you are saved the holy ghost will bear witness when you are sanctified and the holy ghost with empowering the empowering grace will come when you are filled with the holy ghost and the gift of the holy ghost is yours and then in verse 39 it says for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off even as many as the lord are God shall call. In verse 40, it says, and with many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself, rescue yourself, escape out yourself from this untoward, evil, sinful, licentious generation. And then in verse 41, and then they that gladly received this word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls and those people they were convicted of their sins they were really converted and they were committed to studying the Word of God and to practicing the Word of God and we're told in verse 42 it says and they continue steadfastly in the Apostles doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers you see the early church once those converts they come into the kingdom they are they were integrated with the congregation and the teachers and the pastors and the evangelists and the prophets and the apostles and all those ministers they kept on teaching the word of god consistently acts chapter 28 reading from verse 31 acts chapter 28 verse 31 preaching the kingdom of god and teaching those things which concern the lord jesus christ with all confidence no man forbidding him 
that's what continued all the time in the early church and the people they were teaching they expected that they would bring a real grace of God and godliness and the goodness of God into their lives in Colossians chapter 1 reading from verse 28 Colossians chapter 1 reading from verse 28 whom we preach talking about Jesus warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus notice every man three times there when we preach warning every man number one and then teaching every man number two that we may present every man number three perfect in Christ Jesus. In verse 29, it says, whereunto I also labor, striving according to, the, to his walking, which walketh in me mightily. It tells us in First Timothy chapter 4, uh, Paul the Apostle has told us what he was doing uh, and is revealing to us what we ourselves now as teachers of the word, as preachers of the word, as prophets and proclaimers and preachers, what we ought to do and what we ought to concentrate on as we carry on and carry forth and lift up the commission that the Lord Jesus Christ himself has given in First Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 15, meditate upon these things. Everything we're hearing, meditate upon upon these things, the purpose, the significance of teaching for evangelization and edification, med meditate upon these things, everything we have learned, the challenge, the Lord is giving us the charge, the Lord is giving us the commission that he lays before us, meditate upon these things, give thyself holy to them. It's not just to say other people should be committed to evangelization, other people should be committed to preaching the gospel, a pastor should do that, the evangelist should do that, so and so should do that. Everyone, the Lord is speaking to you as he spoke to Timothy, and he says you give yourself holy to them, that thy profiting may appear unto all. Your personal profit as you learn that gets you saved, gets you sanctified, gets you baptized and due to a power that your profit will appear to everyone. And then you're preaching the gospel, you're ministering, winning converts and winning souls into the kingdom of God. And people can see and tell about it and testify concerning you that they're profiting in ministry, you're profiting in service, you're profiting in a work may appear to all and then in verse 16 it says take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine continue in them for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee second timothy chapter 4 reading from verse 1 second timothy chapter 4 we're reading from verse 1, it says, I charge thee therefore before God. Whenever we come to the study, everything we're hearing is a charge before the Almighty God and before the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Verse 2, it says, preach the word. That's the commandment for you, preach the word. That the commission he has given you preach the word and that is the charge he brings before you you cannot say i'm too young preach the word let your life preach the word let your passion preach the word let your going up and down preach the word you cannot say i'm just a woman preach the word are you saved tell another woman the woman at the well left the water pot and went to the town telling everybody and brought them to jesus preach the word and then be instant in season 
out of season, reprove, rebuke, exalt with all long suffering and doctrine. And then he tells us in verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own law shall they heave to themselves, teachers have been itching their ears, and then it said they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. It says, don't let that disturb you. Look at verse 5 there. It says, but watch thou in all things endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. I pray the Lord will help us to do that in Jesus' name. I didn't get your amen well. Second Timothy chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 19. In Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You are going to evangelize, you name the name of Christ. You are going to pray, you name the name of Christ. You are going to counsel, you name the name of Christ. You are going to lift up other people, you name the name of Christ. You are doing soul winning, you are going to name the name of Christ. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Verse 21. In verse 21, it says, if a man therefore purge himself from these, it shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. We'll come to point number two now. Point number two is the silence of the teachable for effectiveness of exhortation. We come to this passage that many people misinterpret and they misapply. Therefore, we need to pay attention. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 28, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God, silence in the church. Let's say, for example, you are uh, a minister and you have, you speak in a particular language. I'm simplifying it for you to understand. And then you come to a congregation and the congregation speaks another language. You speak a different language. You're a man of God, you're sanctified, you're spirit-filled, you're called to the service of the Lord. And there is nobody that can interpret the language that you speak. It will be unwise, it will be unproductive to say, I'm a pastor, I'm a preacher. I'm a teacher. I know I have sound doctrine. I know what I have is correct. Whether they understand or not, I'm going to stand up and speak. And you speak, and there's no interpretation, and nobody understands. It says, if you are like that, and there's no interpreter, keep silence in the church. And if you have the gift of tongues, speaking unknown language, and there's no interpreter, keep silence in the church. Look at Bastachi. In Bastachi, if anything be revealed to another that seated by, let the force hold his peace. It's not even another language now. It's the normal language everybody understands. And you have spoken, you have given your beat. You have taught your own Sunday scripture, or you have done your question and answer, or you have edified the church in the time you are given. And then there's another that still has revelation, exhortation, and impartation to give unto the church. 
if anything be revealed to another that seated by let the first hold his peace let the first person keep quiet and then let the word of god come the revelation of god come from the next minister look at verse 32 in verse 32 it says the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets it says the spirit of the prophet should be under the control of the prophet that is when you hear the word of God it's time for it's not the time for you to talk then keep quiet let's give some examples in the scripture we're looking at Le Leviticus chapter 10 and we're reading from verse 1 Leviticus in the Old Testament Leviticus we're looking at chapter 10 and we're reading from verse 1. It says, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not and then in verse 2 we're told in verse 2 and there went a fire from the lord and devout them and they died before the lord now their father is Aaron, was Aaron and Aaron was the high priest he also had a good ministry in the, among the children of Israel Moses also was the overall leader now the overall leader is going to talk to Aaron and let's let's look at the place of silence when we are rebuked in the church when the word of God is coming forth with instruction and with correction and with conviction the person who is convicted will not rise up and be shouting and defending himself or herself in verse 3 then Moses said unto Aaron this is sage that the Lord speaks saying I will be sanctified in them that come near me and but and before all the people I'll be glorified. Look at this. And Aaron held his peace. It's not only women that are to keep quiet in the church, the rest of us too, while the teaching of the word of God is going on, we should keep quiet. And if you've done something wrong and the word comes to you directly, you should be quiet. And Aaron held his peace. Nehemiah chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 7 it says then i consulted with myself and i rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said unto them ye exact usury every one of his brother and i said a great the great assembly against them look at verse 8 these were noble people in the congregation and i said unto them we after our ability have redeemed our brethren the jews which were which were sold unto the heathen and will ye even sell your brethren or shall they be sold unto us look at this those nobles they didn't say why didn't you call us in private and tell us are you telling us in the presence of the whole congregation they didn't you know react they didn't speak violently and respond to him who do you think you are you must understand when nobles but look at this then held the their peace I've found nothing to answer. When the word of God comes to us, we shouldn't reject the word of God, react to the word of God, and then be talking so loud and be talking, defending ourselves. It says they held their peace. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, it says, Then said they, we will restore them and will requite nothing of them. So will we do as thou sayest. 
is they had to obey him they had to correct whatever was wrong they had to submit to the word of god that's the evidence of salvation if somebody hears the word of god and is finding excuses somebody hears the word of correction and is uh, trying to throw excuses at the preacher that one is not showing evidence of being born again is not showing evidence of being a real child of god a real child of god will submit to the conviction and to the commandment and to the correction of the word of god then i called the priest and took an oath of them that they should do according to this promise we're coming to acts chapter 11 and we're reading from verse 15 acts chapter 11 reading from verse 15 here is peter the apostle talking to the old congregation and he said and as i began to speak the holy ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning and then in verse 16 it said then remembered i the watch of the lord how he said john indeed baptized with water but he shall be baptized with the holy ghost in verse 17 for as much then as god gave them the like gift as he did unto us who are who believed on the lord jesus christ what was i that i could withstand god look at verse 18 verse 18 says when they heard these things they held their peace we must know when to keep quiet when to be silent and when to hold our peace we must understand when the word of god comes or you know maybe they were arguing before because of their tradition peter you went to the gentiles you did this you did that and then he explained to them the spirit bade me go and when they understood this is the work of the Spirit, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then, as God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. And let's come back now to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I'm reading here from verse 34. 1 Corinthians chapter, 13, chapter 14, we're reading from verse 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also says the Lord. We have dealt with, you know, other sections of the church, even the whole church, keeping quiet and keeping silent at the right time. Now, in the Corinthian church, the women were taking their liberty for granted, and they were causing confusion. That's why Paul, the apostle, said, God is not the author of confusion. And there are some churches, uh, you know, the, while the preacher is preaching, oh, no, if somebody, a lady might rise up, he'll say, I hallelujah praise the lord and begin a chorus and then the preacher has to keep quiet and then he preaches for some time and then somebody no that is not so i don't agree with that paul the apostle said now let those women keep quiet in the church already if you read titus chapter 2 the women who are matured who know the word of god are supposed to teach other women they're supposed to counsel other women instruct other women but he's saying that when there is confusion and there is the likelihood of tearing the church apart with your reaction that those women should keep quiet Look at verse 35 in verse 35 and if they will learn anything let them ask their husbands at home it's talking about you know somebody just standing up at the a time that is not appropriate and he's saying pastor what do you say to that 
what do you say to this what do you say to this or somebody has you know already answered a question and the woman stood up and said now I, i'm not dealing with the person who answered the question pastor please stand up and answer this one that's what the apostle paul is saying he said if you are not clear about that your husband is born again your husband is sanctified your husband too is a leader and he knows the word of god why don't you be patient why don't you exercise patience and then when you get back home you can ask your husband at home for it is a shame for women to speak like those women were speaking in the church look at verse 36 it says what came the word of god out from you or came it unto also unto you only you'll find in the congregation of the children of god the apostles and disciples when they were waiting for the holy spirit to come on the day of pentecost mary the virgin was in their midst and there were other women there too they didn't you know take over the microphone from peter and the rest of the apostles and say we too we have something to say and the thing is boiling within us let me talk no the maturity of the christian the maturity that comes with real saturation of scripture made them to come down and then they were able to receive the teaching of the word of god let's look at acts chapter 2 reading from verse 17 acts chapter 2 reading from verse 17 it tells us and it shall come to pass in the last days says god i will pour out my spirit upon all flesh your sons and your daughters your sons and your daughters your sons and your daughters the women too shall prophesy it's not saying that the women cannot prophesy they cannot proclaim they cannot declare the word of god it's saying that when they cause confusion and when their involvement is causing confusion in the church let them keep quiet and go and learn at home and then it says and on your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams then in verse 18 in verse 18 and on my servants and on my hand maidens those are women i will pour out my spirit in those days and they, the servants, men, the handmaidens, women, shall prophesy. We're looking at um, Acts chapter 21, verse 8. Acts chapter 21, we're reading from verse 8. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist. Philip the evangelist and then it says which was one of the seven and abode with him look at verse 9 Paul the apostle was there Luke was there who wrote this and he said we Paul Luke and his company they came to the house of Philip and they saw look at this and the same man had four daughters virgins which did prophesy and paul didn't say be quiet you cannot prophesy he was addressing the confusion in the corinthian church and when he saw these that preached that prophesied that proclaimed the word of god at the appropriate time for the prophet and edification of the hearers he didn't say no stop have you not read first corinthians look at chapter 8 chapter 8 of acts acts chapter 8 we're looking at verse 3 look at this as for saul he made havoc of the church entering into every house and killing men and women men and women throwing them out of the house men and women arresting them men and women and committing them men and women to prison look at verse 4 now in verse 4 therefore they the men and the women that were being persecuted that were being harassed by the persecution therefore they men and women that were scattered abroad 
went everywhere preaching the word. I need to remind you that it's Luke that wrote the Acts of the Apostles. And Luke was a constant companion of Paul the Apostle. And Paul the Apostle didn't say, no, don't try it that way because the women cannot speak in the church in the congregation that's where it says let the men lead the church let the men rule and don't let any woman cause any confusion but when it comes to outside we're evangelizing and we're winning souls and we're talking to people in your school and in your in your market anywhere you are you take that same word the word of salvation the word of redemption and they the men and the women that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word every one of us will be preachers of the word in jesus name Let's come to point number three. Now, point number three, the spirituality of teachers without exaltation or envy. We're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, reading from verse 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, if anyone hearing the word of God think of himself as a prophet, as a preacher, as a proclaimer of the word of God and he says I am matured I am spiritual let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of God here is how we how we declare our spirituality here is how we prove our spirituality that we hear the word of God and we're able to say that is correct and we're going to live according to that if we hear the word of god and it's not in our mind to follow the word of god we're not spiritual if we hear the word of god and it's said uh, to argue against the word of god because it knocks against our tradition and it knocks against our peculiar weakness then we're not spiritual if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. And then in verse 38 it says, But if any man be ignorant after all the study, if any man remains ignorant after the impartation, instruction of the word of God, if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. In verse 39, wherefore brethren, covet to prophesy brethren 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 the word brethren is uh, means uh, brothers and sisters means all the children of god means all the believers when it says brethren there's no other language for the women who are born again the brethren are the brothers and the sisters who have the salvation of the lord and the power of the lord in their lives over his sanctified life wherefore brethren Convert to prophesy, have the passion to prophesy, and forbid not to speak with tongues. Yet in verse 40, he must counsel us, let all things be done by the men and the women, let all things be done by the adult and the young people, let all things be done by the members and the ministers, let all things be done decently and in order. And I pray as the Lord has raised us up to be teachers of the word and to be spiritual, everything he has called us to do, we will do to the edification of the church and the evangelization of the world in Jesus' name. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 4 and reading from verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, and he gave some apostles and he gave some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers why look at verse 12 for the perfecting of the saints anyone who ministers in the church you're ministering for a short time you're ministering frequently whatever the area of ministry apostle prophet evangelist pastor teacher any minister is for the perfecting of the saints for the maturing of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of christ 
Christ for the edifying of the body of Christ. And then in verse 13, it says, until we all come, we keep on ministering, the teacher keeps on teaching, the pastor keeps on pastoring, the evangelist keeps on evangelizing, and the, um, and the prophet keeps on uh, prophesying, and the apostles, they keep on ministering to the church until we all come in the unity of the faith. We don't stop the ministry. We don't say now everybody can, you know, go on their own and be on their own and study the Bible for their own. The printing press have printed the Bible. The Bible Society has printed the Bible. Now take the Bible and be by yourself. Doesn't matter whether you come again or not. No, it says all those ministers keep on ministering and teaching and preaching and prophesying and proclaiming and evangelizing until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ in verse 14 it says in verse 14 that we henceforth be no more children immature babes tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sledge of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive then in verse 15 it says but speaking the truth in love apostle speaking the truth in love prophet speaking the truth in love evangelist speaking the truth in love pastor speaking the truth in love teachers speaking the truth in love that women now grow up into him in all things which is the hedge even Christ. It tells us this we do in unity with all the other teachers and preachers of the world. That's what shows our maturity. That's what shows our spirituality. But if we're always contradicting, if we're always opposing, if we're always saying, no, I disagree. If we have disagreeable spirit to the word of God, there's no spirituality there. There's no maturity there it tells us in isaiah chapter 50 chapter 52 and i'm reading from verse 8 isaiah chapter 52 verse 8 it said thy watchmen shall lift up the voice with the voice together shall they sing for they shall see eye to eye apostles and prophets they shall see eye to eye evangelists and pastors they shall see eye to eye the ministers and the teachers and the in the church they shall see eye to eye when the lord shall bring again zion it tells us in uh, chapter 57 of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 57 verse 15 for thus says the, uh, the high and the lofty one that inhabits eternity. Here is the ancient of days. Here is the God our creator, our maker. Here is the God, the final judge of every action and the final judge of every minister, of every ministry. It says thus says the Lord, the high and the holy one that inhabits eternity whose name is holy i dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit whatever our ministry whatever our, our responsibility whatever our duty in the church in the congregation of the living god he wants us to be contrite and humble in spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones as ministers of the gospel there's no self exaltation and there is no envy the spirituality of teachers must be without self exaltation and must be without envy it tells us in Matthew chapter 23 Matthew chapter 23 
3, verse 12, Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. The one who feels that, you know, I'm the most important, and without me, nothing else can be done. I have the ministry, I have the teaching, I have the revelation, I have the psalm, I have the tongue, I have this, and then he exalts himself. And it's not teachable. It's not going to listen to the words that the Father, the Heavenly Father has sent to teach us and to mature us in the church. Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. He shall be abased here on earth. And if he dies in that self-exaltation, he will be abased in all eternity. And, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. We're coming to Philippians chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 15. Philippians chapter 1, verse 15. If we're spiritual, there is no self-exaltation. If we're spiritual, there is no envy. It says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 15, Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife and some of also goodwill there are people surprisingly what they do is out of self-exaltation what they do is out of envy he can do it i can do it too he can say that i can say that too he can manifest that i can manifest that too and what they do is not on that submission to the spirit of god it is with envy it says in verse 16 it says the one preach christ of contention not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds those who preach out of self-exaltation out of you know contradiction out of opposition out of envy there's no reward for them because they are not serving the lord they're serving themselves romans chapter one we're reading from verse 29 romans chapter one we're reading from verse 29 being filled with all unrighteousness fornication wickedness covetousness maliciousness full of envy this uh, this thing that are listed here they're listed there as the life of the unconverted and if anyone then says i'm uh, you know i'm a minister i'm a preacher i'm a teacher and everything is doing uh, is because of envy because of self-exaltation because of a spirit of strife it's not different from a sinner if he dies in that condition he cannot get to heaven he's full of envy murder debate deceit malignity whispers look at verse 32 in verse 32 who knowing the judgment of god that they which commit such things uh, in envy and included are worthy of death not only do the same but have pleasure in them that do the James chapter 3 we're reading from verse 14 in James chapter 3 verse 14 but if ye have envy and strife in your heart preaching if ye have envy and strife in your heart evangelizing if ye have envy and strife in your heart you are staging this and staging this we too can do this and we too can do that and the whole church is having a crusade and we're having the crusade and we're transmitting it everywhere but somebody says why are they choosing that place why are they going to that city they should come over here to you therefore we're not going to take part in that we'll still do crusade crusade is crusade and we're going to gather our own here my friend i cannot call you my brother i cannot call you my sister because if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts glory not lie not against the truth in verse 15 he tells us this wisdom descendeth not from above but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. In verse 16, it says, For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every 
evil work. We must say, have our hearts cleansed and purged from all envy, from pride, from self-exaltation, and be humble and be submissive to the way of the Lord and move in unity with the church of the living God so that the same spirit that leads us at the headquarters will lead everywhere. There'll be no envy, there'll be no evil work. Then in verse 17, it says, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Verse 18 it tells us, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. I pray that every one of us will have the peace of God and peace with God in our hearts, in our lives, in the fellowship, in the church, in Jesus' name. And everything we do will show that one, we are saved and spiritual. Two, we are sanctified and spiritual. Three, we are spirit-filled, baptized the Holy Ghost and spiritual. We are serving and we are spiritual. We are supplicating, we are praying and we are spiritual. We are winning souls and we are spiritual. And we are getting ready for the coming of the Lord because we are part of the second coming church and we remain spiritual. And anything that will make us have self exaltation of pride or envy or jealousy, the blood of Jesus will cleanse everything away from every heart in Jesus' name. A good, good amen. amen. Let's rise up now. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer that everything we have learned today, the Lord will take everything and beautify our lives and lift up our lives and enrich our lives and charge us and edify us and cleanse us and, and purge us and prepare us for greater service in the kingdom of God. Let's open our mouths and pray unto the Lord. We have come to the Bible said that we may learn. And the Lord has given us as a reach our hearts with learning. What have you learned? Have you learned? Have you learned something you need to correct in your heart? Something to correct in your attitude? Something to correct in your behavior? something to correct in your relationship with other people we came that we might learn have you learned of necessity of repentance have you learned that have you learned of the need for righteousness have you learned that have you learned of the need of total, total freedom from sin? Have you learned that? Have you learned of real salvation, the joy of salvation, the victory of salvation? Have you learned that? Except we learn that we have not profited in the world. Open your mouth and pray unto the Lord. Say, Lord, everything I've learned today, they become practical, workable, truth in my life and let the grace of God come in into my heart and help me to demonstrate what I've learned you've learned about the grace of God that comes and sanctifies us tell the Lord and the power of the Spirit of God tell the Lord You are taught that you might learn. Any improvement in your life? Any progress in your life? Any profit? Because of what you have learned? Anything to take to the Lord in prayer? Oh Lord, chisel that out of my life. Cut that off from my life. Cleanse me from that. Wash me from that. Let there be the real evidence of salvation. Following peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Grant me the passion of a real child of God. 
not to learn and remain dull, dense, deaf, dumb to the word of the Spirit? Are you born again? Saved? Are you carrying guilt, the guilt of sin about? The blood of Jesus is available. The grace of God is available. And the power of the truth that saves, that sets us free, makes you a new creature. Old things pass away. All things become new. New life. New actions. New higher level of obedience to the word of God. Teaching is significant in the church to evangelize the world, to edify the church. And when we are well taught, we take that evangelistic truth to the world, to our communities, to our friends, to our neighbors. And the truth we have learned will help us to go and declare the word of salvation, evangelizing the world. And when the church is uniting together, putting resources together to evangelize, what we have learned, what we have received from the Lord will grant us the passion, the fire, the fervency to unite with the church and take the truth of salvation everywhere. You'll be part of the congregation going into all the world and evangelizing the world. The truth we we'll learn will bring edification. Your prayer life is down. You'll be edified and charged like you charge your battery. Zeal down. The zeal will come up from what you have learned. As you meditate on what you have learned, you internalize what you have learned, you personalize what you have learned, you spend time in prayer, supplication before the Lord, taking what you have learned to the Lord in prayer. You wake up from your spiritual slumber and the teaching becomes profitable in your life. Saved, you move on, you're sanctified. And the word of truth is written on the table of your heart. And as the Spirit is reminding you of the word you have learned while you're at home, while you're at work, while you're on the road, you live by that word that the Spirit is registering on your heart. And you'll not be a forgetful hearer, the Spirit of truth will bring to your remembrance what you have learned at a time of temptation, at a time of confusion, at a time when the world is wanting to pressurize you into their mold. The Spirit of God 
will bring to your remembrance what you have learned and will lead you and guide you into the truth that keeps you free free from sin free from evil free from iniquity and you'll not be talkative if you know the Lord the Lord will help you to know when to be silent, quiet, not arguing every time, talking every time, defending self every time. Always having a question, I have a question, I have a question. And while the teaching of the Word of God is going on in your local church, instead of paying attention, you're thinking about the question I'm going to ask. I don't want to confuse the whole congregation with your question. Sis, keep quiet. Be silent. If you're a woman, you can ask your husband at home. If you're a child, you can ask daddy or mommy at home. If you're a man, you can ask those leaders are above you at home if you, if you have the tendency of causing confusion by the questions you ask have the grace of quietness the grace of silence your life will show maturity not always acting under impulse, talking under impulse, impatient, boisterous, noisy, silence. And the spirituality of those who have been taught in the word of the Lord in unity with all the other teachers that watch men shall see eye to eye when the Lord has broken the captivity and brought us out of captivity will see eye to eye not always in your heart in your mind I disagree with that I disagree with that I disagree with that sanctification brings oneness unity one accord for the word of god one accord with christ one accord with other sanctified believers and ministers no self-exaltation the one that is haughty, proud, will be brought down by God. Humble yourselves, therefore, in the presence of the Lord, that he may lift you up in the right time. No envy. If you have bitter envy, jealousy in your heart, Lie not against the spirit. That kind of wisdom does not come from above. Envy is devilish, is sensual, is worldly. Jealousy does not show the grace of salvation. Tell the Lord to cleanse you, purge you, wash you, make you as white as snow, make you whiter than snow. And tell the Lord to give you the passion, the zeal, the fervency to serve the Lord, to win souls into the kingdom. 
and pray that those who come into the kingdom through you will have the righteousness of faith that will help them to make it to heaven on the final day and be a good example to your converts too that the life you live will be an encouragement to move them on in the way of the Lord in righteousness and holiness all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we thank you for everything we have learned today. We pray, Lord, that your spirit will write everything on the tables of every heart and our lives will bring glory to you and bring others into the kingdom. That our lives will show the grace of salvation, of sanctification, and the grace of reconciliation with you, having the righteousness of the Lord demonstrated in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to be matured in the Lord. No sin, no corruption, no defilement, no self-exaltation, no pride, no envy, no jealousy, but our life will show the meekness and the grace of the Lord in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. We we'll pray will not be backward, we we'll move forward in Jesus' name. Help every one of us to grow higher, go higher in the things of the Lord in Jesus' name. Wash away and cleanse away the past and bring us into new life. Make us white as white as snow, whiter than snow in Jesus' name. And the power to be and to do everything you want us to be and do, grant us that power in Jesus' name. Make us more mature, make us spiritual, make us heavenly minded, that our lives will lead other people to deeper, higher relationship with you in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah.